United Church this March 15, 2020. As you know, we are not holding our regular church services because of the coronavirus and our attempts to help the spread to cease. We are going to record our service though and we'll be posting it on Facebook and our website and it'll also be broadcast on TV. As we stumble through these unknown times, we're going to try new things. Maybe we'll live stream at some point. But I hope that you would join us in worship and that you would feel welcome in being able to join us in any way you can. Indeed, we can't be here with one another, but we can be with each other in spirit. We can be with each other in song. We can be with each other in prayer. And let us take this service, let us take this time, this Lenten journey, to indeed do that with one another while we have to remain somewhat distant. Let us now open with our moment of reflection. Let us now join in our call to worship. O oh, come, let us sing to our God, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving, singing joyful songs of praise. Our God is great, sovereign above all powers and principalities. The sea, the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains, indeed all creation were made by God and belong to God. So come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Holy One, our Maker. For yes, God is our God, and we are God's people. Oh, that today we would listen for the Lord's voice. And let us join in our prayer of invocation. God of grace and truth, we come to your house today to worship you. We bring all of ourselves to you, all of the good and all of the bad. We entrust our hidden, fearful, and fragile selves to your transforming power and gentle, loving care. Help us not harden our hearts as our ancestors did in the wilderness, requiring proof of your faithfulness. Let us trust and believe in your miracles and witness to your love. All blessing, glory, and honor are yours alone. Thank you for the many ways your Spirit breaks into our lives and into this troubled world. We offer this prayer in the name of the One whose name is above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn today is the first one ever. It's in your hymn packet or can be found in the Methodist hymnal number 276. The first one ever.
during this moment where we would normally share peace with one another by shaking hands or perhaps even embracing, by coming near each other and by joining in peace, let us instead take this moment to say a silent prayer of peace. Name those people in your life that need God's peace. Be with those people in prayer who you know need peace and pray for this world which needs our peace evermore. Let us pray our moment of peace. And may all God's people say, Amen. Let us now, with hearts at peace, pray our prayer of confession. For forty years God contended with that generation and said, They are my people whose hearts go astray, and they do not regard my ways. Today have we learned from their struggles. Today have we rededicated our hearts to God. Do we strain our ears to hear God's voice? Because we know the answers to these questions. God of mercy, hear the prayers of your people. For every time we have attributed your miracles in our lives to our own hands alone, forgive us, we pray. For every time we promised to trust you, but turned to our own way when your response did not come soon enough or in the way we expected, grant us mercy, O oh God. For the many opportunities to extend forgiveness that we have refused, show us what it means to love again, dear Lord. For each time we resist your command to love those who believe differently from us, direct us in the way of peace, we pray. And for our silent sins, our quiet acts of violence, in our indifference to the suffering around us, forgive us, loving God, and remake us into vessels of tenderness and compassion. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And let us hear now these words of assurance. Because of God's great love for us, we have peace with God and are blessed by God's grace. All through Jesus Christ, who, while we were still sinners, died to free us from the bondage of sin. Thanks be to God, who fills our souls with living water. Amen. <clears throat> Our first scripture reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 through 17. Hear now these words of Holy Scripture. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of, Egypt, out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people. Take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? 
Our second reading today is from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Hear this letter of Paul to the church in Rome. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given for us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's time for the children's message. Children, normally I would invite you forward, but that's going to be difficult today. So perhaps sit near whatever device you are watching this on or listening to this to. Um, even adults come near at this time. I wanted to ask today because we hear from these scriptures about people calling out and testing God, people calling out and being ungodly in some situations. Have you ever done something that you knew was wrong? Have you ever maybe felt maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but still God might not be there? These are tough questions for children to handle. These are tough questions for any age to handle. And I think today, even in a brief children's message in this moment that we can share together, I want to reassure you that God is indeed with you. That no matter what you have done or could do, that God can forgive anything. That God is greater than anything you can do. And that if you feel bad or sad, if you feel lonely, maybe you don't know what you did, maybe you know exactly what you did to just encourage you to take all of that to God, to pray for God's forgiveness, to pray thank you to God that grace comes through Jesus Christ, and to pray that you may not understand any of what I just said, <laughs> but that God understands your prayers. God understands your heart. God understands your soul, because God created you just to be who you are. God loves you just as you are. And so, go as God's child and fill this world with that same love. Let us pray. Lord, as you guide all of us as your children, indeed help us to know and feel your love in the moments when we've done something we know is wrong, in the moments when we may not know what we have done to be wrong, in the moments, God, when we feel alone, in those moments when we feel you near, help us to always know we are yours and yours alone, always and forever a child of God. Amen. Our second hymn, it's Fill My Cup, Lord. It's in the Worship and Song hymnal or your hymnal packet. 
and it's number 3093. This is Fill My Cup One. Our gospel reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 30 and 39 through 42. Hear these words from Jesus. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up, to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw my water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. 
The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship God neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You will worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth, for God seeks such as these to worship. God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done, she said. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two more days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Thank you, God, indeed, for your word, for your lessons, for reaching out to us at the well and where we are, for reaching out to us wherever we may be today, for guiding us in your ways. May you open our hearts and our minds and our ears, and as always, may our worship be pleasing unto you. Amen. The name of our message today is Unprepared. I'm going to have Marty pan up to the cross and the altar so that you don't only have to look at me, but that you can get a nice perspective during this message. One time I planned a day-long hike for Amanda and myself. We were planning on hiking out to a place called Rabbit Ears. We were going to eat lunch out there and then return home. Since we knew this trip, it was going to be a long one. We packed not only our lunch, but plenty of water to drink along the way. We had a very nice trip, but on our way back to our car, we noticed a group of hikers coming toward us that had not packed much of anything. Knowing they had quite a bit of hiking ahead of them in the summer heat of the mountains in Colorado, and that they had only a little bit of water and that was it, we gave them what water we had left and some bananas to eat to boot. But as we journeyed on, the thought kept going through my mind how unprepared they were for this long journey they were going on. Unprepared is probably exactly how our ancestors who we hear in the Genesis passage for today must have felt when they had to journey through the wilderness and did not know where their food would come from or where they might get water. All they knew is that they had to get out of Egypt and follow God's call into the wilderness. But what they were truly unprepared for was how God would work in their lives and provide for them all they would ever need. Unprepared is exactly what the Samaritan woman at the well was for Jesus that day. As we hear in our gospel passage, she was so stunned that a Jew would even be talking to her, a Samaritan woman, let alone a stranger at a well. But the most stunning thing Jesus does for her is to tell her everything from her past that only she would know about, demonstrating to her that he is a prophet until the time she can say to Jesus that she has heard of one who will come, who is to be called the Messiah. And Jesus ultimately reveals himself as, I am he. Unprepared was she also because she was being offered the living water of forgiveness, grace, mercy, and love that only Jesus can provide. Water which will quench the eternal thirst of our sinfulness, 
water that will never run out. And in an act of great significance, but is so often overlooked in this, in this famous passage, this stunned Samaritan woman who had just been personally welcomed into eternal life through Jesus returns to town to witness to everyone there. But she leaves her water jar behind. What need have we of any other water when we have the word of Jesus? Unprepared. As I give this message today, we are in the midst of two seasons which leave us seemingly unprepared. Lent and a new one to us, coronavirus. As a person who does not believe in luck and seeks to find how God is working in everything, I do not want to tie God's will into any virus or pandemic. However, the fact that this is striking us in the midst of the season of Lent cannot go unnoticed. At the time when we are fasting, praying, meditating, spending time reflecting on our own existence and our soul journey with God, we are now also having to be separated, distanced, away from what is normal, and take precautions that leave us at best feeling unprepared and at worst, panicked. See, we like to think we are very different from the ancient Israelites who were berating Moses and asking him why he led them out of Egypt into this wilderness where they have no food or drink. Sure, they may have been slaves back in Egypt, but at least they had stuff to drink and to eat. But no, we are not like those people. Those people panicked and turned to the only thing that they knew as normal. Those people questioned why God would ever leave them to be in this wretched desert. Those people did not trust that God would provide. But we are very different from those people, aren't we? And are we so different from the woman at the well? Perhaps we say to ourselves, if Jesus were talking to me, I would know it was him. Or we say, why didn't she just trust and believe it right away when she saw him? Of course he was Jesus. Or we say, how come the townspeople had to invite Jesus to their town to preach? Why didn't they just trust the woman's testimony? Again, are we very different from that woman or the townspeople? Would we know it if God was talking to us through a Savior? Would we know it if God were talking to us directly? Would we trust someone who witnesses the faith to us that her testimony is true and real? Or are we a see-it-for-myself type people? I think we know the answers to these questions, and that is why I ask them rhetorically. But here is the hope amidst our journey that comes from our passage in Romans. God sent Jesus, Jesus came, and did so even before we could know, even before we could believe, in our total unpreparedness, God saved us. Which begs the excellent question, why? God sent Jesus, who willingly died for our sins upon the cross, because we are always unprepared. Whether we willingly sin or unknowingly sin, our hearts need the reconciling love of Jesus Christ to save us, because there is an imperfection to our humanity that prevents us from being totally prepared. At any point in time, we are the lost in the wilderness, who are doubting our God and asking for food and water. Or perhaps even asking to be enslaved by the sins of our creature comforts, as we deny that God can or will provide. Or are denying God, perhaps, and worshiping our false idols of government or television or celebrity who we think can provide for us. At any point in time, we are the Samaritan woman by the well, trying to hide the sins of our past, trying to hide the sins of our present, trying to be something we are not, and being called to the cross through Jesus, who knows the depths of our souls. But the hope in this is that at every point in time, we are also loved by our Creator, who knows every hair on our head, every inch of our bodies, and who loves us beyond compare. The hope is that though unprepared, though imperfect, though sinners, though guilty of treating our neighbors as enemies and our friends as strangers, 
The hope is that our God saved us by a grace we cannot obtain on our own, by a power not found through food or water, by a forgiveness that runs deeper than the deepest well, and by a love that can outlast any season, any virus, any wilderness we may be going through. This is the hope in the eternal Christ who has saved our souls for eternity through the Easter we will one day celebrate and hope that we will once again come together as a congregation and be able to worship and see each other and perhaps even embrace that we made it through an unprecedented wilderness, that we survived by the grace of God. And in these times, in this wilderness of Lent and coronavirus, when we indeed feel most unprepared, we must use our God-given wisdom and scientifically appropriate precautions to limit our exposure to each other. However, we can still pray, we can still call one another, we can still love and we can still be together in this journey through the blessing of a phone call, a letter, a card, a note, a mysterious bag of groceries on a stranger's doorstep, and yes, yes, maybe even an extra package of toilet paper left for those who need it. All kidding aside, I am just as guilty as the next person of being against the distancing modern technology affords. But we too often forget that medical improvements, modern technology, and the devices we use that indeed can separate us, if put to the right purposes, can also be used to draw us together. This is the blessed perspective that we all too often forget in these times of peril. Yes, if we want, we can fall into despair and depression. But if we hope, if we have faith in God, if we trust in Christ's promise, then we can make it through by relying on God's word, God's grace, and God's love through each and every one of us. We are amidst the wilderness. We are on a long hike that seems to have no end. But let us not despair. For we know that there is an Easter light on the horizon. We know that our God will not forsake us. We know that when we cry out to God for help in the middle of life's trials and tribulations, that God hears our prayers. And when all seems lost, we know and trust and believe in Jesus, who is living water, food without end, and eternal love everlasting. So we may be unprepared. We may be in over our heads. Perhaps we even feel we are on a long hike without the basics to get us through, parched, hungry, thirsting for normalcy. Then let us turn to our guide, our provider, our eternal God. For God has given us the eternal water of Jesus Christ, the manna of our daily bread, and God is longing for us and loving us, even when we are unprepared. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Lord, we come here today and we are distant from one another. We are distant because we have entered a season which we have not seen for quite some time, if ever, where we have to be separate from one another. God, let us not be separate, though, in spirit. Let us not be separate in prayer. Let us be together in this wilderness journey, God, as you call us to be, close with each other in our hearts, close to each other in our thoughts close to each other, because we are all connected by your Holy Spirit, God. We are all connected by your eternal love. These times make us worry, though, perhaps even fearful and afraid, perhaps doubting, God, why you would even lead us in this place, why you would even call us to be amidst this desert, why you would even call us to a well that's too deep for us to draw water. In these moments, God, remind us 
that you are living water. You are the spring that flows eternal. You are a God who provides beyond anything this world can provide. For you have granted us eternal life through the grace and forgiveness and love of Jesus Christ, that no matter what this world may bring, this world is not the end. Our lives here are not the final chapter, that we have another existence, God, with you in a new heaven and a new earth, in a blessed place where there is no disease, there is no virus, there is no loneliness or despair. And until we reach that one fine day, God, we pray that you are with us in our existence here. For indeed, you also sent Jesus to be with us in the fullness of time so that we could know that our Savior knows the pain we feel, the fears we have, the humanity that is part of our existence. And in that compassion, God, we pray thanks be to you that you hold us in your eternal arms. Perhaps, God, though there are prayers that people need to pray today that are too deep for words to reach, and it is in those moments, God, that we now pause in silence to search our hearts for those prayers deep within our souls. God, as we join all our prayers together, we do so, praying the prayer taught to us by our Savior, which rings full of hope, eternal in you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen indeed. We now come to a time of holy offering. Interesting question of how to do this when we have to be so distant from each other. I would encourage you, if this was a time that you normally would grant your tithes and offerings to the church, that you would take a moment indeed and fill that out and dedicate those and set those aside to send into the church. If this is a moment when you gave out of your prayers and out of your heart because you did not have of money to give, then take this moment to sit in silent prayer and listen to the sweet music that we will play. If this is a moment when you just want to sit and reflect, and relax, then do that. For this is holy offering, when we give of all of ourselves to God.
And now let us take all our offerings together and join them in our doxology, which we will sing together. benefit from them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen indeed. I should have warned you at the beginning that uh, we don't have a song leader today, so it'll be mostly just the piano. If you hear me in the background, I do apologize, but uh, maybe in a couple weeks we might have another song leader back here. Our closing hymn today is Jesus Paid It All, and I certainly hope that you've been singing along with us as you can if you had the hymn packet or if you had the hymnals. But even if you didn't, I hope that you feel that worship through the music, even if you are listening, is worship indeed. Our closing hymn is Jesus Paid It All. trust in the promise that Jesus met us in our wilderness, that God came down loving us and longing after us, and that Jesus, who died for all our sins, did so out of a great love that we would be unprepared for, a great love we might not know, but a great love that once we have seen and taken 
and prayed and longed after has become in our life everything. Go in peace, brothers and sisters. Journey through the wilderness. Be with God and share that love of Christ with one another. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.